And welcome back to another edition of Deep Into the Heart of Wrestling. My name is Mike Larkin, and joined by my side, as always, is my boy, RD, and the place to be, Bay Hey B, Robert Davis. How are you, Robert? I'm good. How are you, Mike? I am good. And as always, joined by us, well, much like Tony Khan, we be in the fear of our lives uh, when it comes to this creature, this being, this overall entity that is the Demoness. How are you, Nicola? Good evening. <laughs> I'm okay. How are you both doing? Good. Feeling good. I mean, first and foremost, guys, we just come off some great shows. If you want to go back and listen to our past episodes where we talk about Bray Wyatt, where we talk about everything from Rosemary to Bray Wyatt and just all the great things that are happening in the world of professional wrestling. But today's topic is going to be really, really fun, especially the time frame of where we are, folks. In about one month's time, we're going to have four years of Dynamite, the first ever episode that gave us Cody Rhodes versus Sammy Guevara, and so many great moments with the inner circle and Chris Jericho with the AEW World's Heavyweight Championship and a little bit of the bubbly and we're also coming on four years of AEW it's early inception if you will and then we talk about the COVID era and everything that goes into it so guys first and foremost and Roberto I'll start with you before we get into our timeline and everything that is encompassed with the world of all elite wrestling how crazy is that to think four years since the inception of AEW a lot has happened in four years uh I mean personally professionally uh just kind of watching everything unfold um just even thinking about the facts when they announced AEW uh, on BTE and then holding up their phones, uh, I think they were in Japan at the time. And uh, just it, it's wild to think, you know, it, it started as a mere thought to where it is now a billion dollar company, apparently. One billion dollars to quote Dr. Evil. <laughs> so. For you, Nicola <laughs> McDonald, we have another great professional wrestling company coming into fruition. It's always great to see startups. Competition is good. Competition is healthy. But also at the same time, people got to work. Business has to be done. And another wrestling promotion is here in AEW All Elite Wrestling. What were your thoughts on the initial announcement? So, obviously, at the time, I will admit I came late into AEW because I was all about, as you know, as you both know, it was all TNA for me for a very, 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 very long time. And it still is. But um, when I first saw it, I was curious. I was like, oh, something new, something interesting. Let's see what goes on. And it was something that people quickly fell in love with very, very quickly. So, yeah, I was, uh, it was a very, like you said, the Dr. Evil quote. Go with that one. One billion dollars. Yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, I mean, you look at it from a stance too as well. You have this guy in Tony Khan who we're getting to Tony throughout this forum, but you have a guy in Tony Khan who attended the G1 Supercar. That was the one that featured Cody and Okada, right? You see him in the crowd, then all in comes to fruition. You got to give a shout out to Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks, three gentlemen that just want to come into fruition, as well as Kenny Omega, putting on other wrestling promotion, the alternative, if you will, to what WWE was producing around the 2018-2019 time period. So it was a breath of fresh air. I mean, you saw Chris Jericho come into the works. You saw the rise of one Maxwell Jacob Friedman, MJF. You had so many new names come, and Nyla Rose was at that press conference. Conference, we saw so many different levels and layers of people that we saw, not just from independent promotions, but that we've seen from Impact, Ring of Honor, Pro Wrestling Gorilla, and I'll give a shout out to you over there in Cali, Mr. Robert Davis, whoop, whoop, Santino Brothers. But that's the thing too, man. You have so many great talents coming from across the pond. You have so many great talents wanting to just become this evolution slash revolution, if you will, that is AEW All Elite Wrestling. And I mean, the first shows, I mean, we've had the double and nothings. We've had Fight for the Fallen. And one way I want to start with this is because Robert Davis, we have imitated this. And this is where I start with you on this, my friend. I don't need a friend. I don't need a tag team partner. I need my brother. <laughs> Cody Rhodes and Dustin Rhodes, man. Talk about it. What a damn match. Um, you know, with Dustin and all he did in WWE and uh, just the latter part of those WWE years for him. Uh, he didn't do much and we didn't see him. Um, so, you know, I, I know a lot of people probably wondered, you know, what's he doing? Like, he should have retired 10 years ago. And uh, he just went out there and put on this match with his brother and proved everybody wrong. Um, you know, the man still has it. I mean, they, they don't call him the natural for nothing, you know. Um, I, I remember watching Dustin as a kid in WCW and thinking just like, damn, 
that that's pretty wild to think this is Dusty's son. Uh, you know, Dusty was one of my favorites when I was a wee bit uh, glad myself and just to really kind of see it go from Dusty to Dustin to Cody and um, just this evolution of the Rhodes family was uh, pretty mind blowing um, just to see how that just came to fruition. And um, just the iconic promo, Cody, and we all know Cody. Uh, Cody, Co- Cody can do the promo. He can do the promo very well. And um, just that that promo <laughs> and that line that we uh, just like to say over and over, um, man, that's uh, that's definitely one that uh, will never be replicated again. So what he's saying right now, folks, when it comes to Dustin Rhodes and him being the natural, take it back to the early WCW days, much like his running bulldog, Robert Davis was in a lone star state of mind when it comes to Dustin Rhodes and the Rhodes family being from Austin, Texas, the son of the plumber. The son of the plumber, if you will. will. So Nicola McDonald, you got Cody Rhodes, you got Dustin Rhodes, which a lot of people were like, hey, man. Why didn't we ever get a WrestleMania match between the Rhodes brothers? I mean, we got with the Hardys. We got with the Hart brothers. I mean, we had one match at Fastlane in 2015 when it was gold against Stardust. But let me tell you right now, folks, to put it bluntly, that match was the drizzling shizits. And then we got it four years later here in AEW at its inception. So I want to ask you, Nikola, your thoughts on the brother-to-brother Cody, Dustin Rhodes, the dynamic that was that match. I absolutely love that. It was everyone wanted to see it, and there was just so much tension to the build up of it because you're all like, oh no, they're both very talented. Which one the brother? Because that's what it always is. Which one the brothers is going to win? Having two brothers myself, I've seen it, but not obviously as wrestlers, but yeah, you know what I mean. But um, yeah, it was all, and they were great fighters. They always had great one liners, and there was a lot of, uh, I'd, that match, I think I was just screaming the whole time again as normal, <laughs> shutting the house down because there was probably blood. It was blood involved, so if there is, you know, I'm going to be shouting and a lot. Someone can vouch for that as well because they hear me when I'm watching AEW yeah. with them. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say there there was a lot of blood in that match, and and, and I know you were yeah. particularly fond of that because there was so much blood. Yeah, yeah, correct, hundred <laughs> percent. It's the perverse. I sound weirder and weirder every week. <laughs> no, no, you're not a weirdo at all. But I mean, I look at it from a stance too as well. When you talk about old school res- wrestling, the overall proverbial crimson mask, if you will, you need it. And I mean, it's rep- it represents the old NWA style of what we saw. I mean, you look at Roddy Piper and Greg Valentine back in the day with the dog collar match. And I mean, Cody Rhodes and Nick Aldis from the first NW for the first All In Man with the NWA World Title on the line, which was very historic. And I mean, Nick Aldis right now is the producer over there now at the WWE. So I mean, his career trajectory also. What was what were your thoughts on the original consensus of Mag? like coming and doing that match and really really show highlighting the nwa and nico i'll start with you on this one because you being a tna fan you saw the rise of magnus i did i saw it from start to finish it was uh when he first came in because obviously a lot of people knew him from the show gladiators yep was it gladiators yeah american gladiators and, uh, the UK version. Yeah. yeah 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 we had that as well so i heard it about him from there and then when he came in I watched him go from someone that was kind of, I don't want to say this, invisible to then there. You knew where he was. And then he, his, old, his old thing was he became part of like the whole Dixie Carter era as well, didn't he? And he was like the front man for a little while. And then him and Bram and then him and Mickey James. And yeah, his evolution was quite cool. And the only thing I hated was the fact that I remember this rightly. Didn't he use a hammer to win? Uh, or this is my point of view. When he became champion TNA, I don't think he should have done. But that was because I thought he cheated. Am I wrong? No, you're right because he was joining oh, Dixie. He hey. was joining Dixie Land with Dixie Carla, honey, and he was a rock star. Yeah, spot. He was... Can you get me a sarsaparilla? That was it, rock... <laughs> Yeah, Rockstar <laughs> Spud. Bless him. Oh. <laughs> but no, Not you were. Who want to be? <laughs> but no you were correct and oh, we'll go to robert on this from magnus's <laughs> transition much like nicholas said there, having the great match that he did with cody being the nwa world champion for over a thousand days what were your initial thoughts of that matchup in the first all-in that we had roberto that was actually my first uh my first experience with uh, nick aldis 
when I was uh, coming back into wrestling and kind of figuring out everybody again, um, you know, I went to go look up NWA to see if it was still around because it was something that I remembered when I was a kid. And, you know, I seen this guy, Nick Aldis, he had the belt. I was just like, the hell is this guy? Okay, whatever. Uh, so when it came down to his match with Cody, um, he put on hell of a match. So then I started to go back and kind of look at, you know, the Magnus stuff and all the things that he was doing over there in TNA, which was pretty cool. Um, and, and I see why he had the belt for a thousand days. It's good at what he did. I so just pretty much saying, didn't, okay. didn't he also go for Willow as well? Was it Bram convinced him to go against Willow or something? And they broke into the heart and then Willow basically just destroyed him. Uh, so you're, Jeff Hardy. You're, you're bringing back memories <laughs> over here. Magnus, your reign has no effect on me because I have an umbrella. Yes, so EC3. And he and him with that umbrella and yeah, <laughs> that's the end of <laughs> things. So EC3 <laughs> and Rockstar Spud invading to go against Willow and then Magnus and Rockstar Spud. Yes, see, we're taking it back to 2013-2014 impact. See, sometimes you used to say something and then it'll be my brain will go into overload and it'll be, hang on, that happened too, didn't it? So yeah, I have a habit of doing this, so yeah. Oh, no, you're fine. I mean, for <laughs> God's sake, Rockstar Spud invaded AJ Styles' house to get a contract with Dixie Carter. And he's yeah. like, man, come to my house? Yes, I remember. Jeez. Good times. Great memories, folks. Great memories. So not. No, but anyway, back to the all week part of the show. When I mean, from what we had there, we had good matches. We have the different alternatives. We see people on the rise coming up. And I mean, you want to have a platform to people to showcase their talents. They might have gotten a WWE trap, but WWE really didn't see much into them. So they're like, hey, we're going to show you who they are, what they're about. Boom, here's the AEW All E Wrestling platform. So we get to 2019, and one of the big inceptions that really came in, and we'll get to Jericho and the bubbly here in a second, but there was this guy that came in. He was pissed off with the creative WWE. One of his brothers was out with leukemia. He was involved in that that feud with Seth Rollins where he wore the germ mask looking like something out of just I don't know what. But it was very interesting to see that trajectory of Dean Ambrose back to John fucking Moxley taking out Kenny Omega. Had that match with Joey Janela where there was a lot of blood and felt like the old CCW John Moxley, the one who was on the independence. No fucks given. I'm going to go into you, rail you hard. Boom. Robert Davis, your thoughts of John Moxley's exit from WWE to his inception and his beginnings in AEW? I, I was kind of in the minority because I, I know a lot of people, especially people that uh, we hang around with, didn't really care for Dean Ambrose. Um, I, I I thought the character was pretty cool. Um, it, it seemed like, I don't know, there was just always something about the Dean Ambrose character that was kind of off, and I, I kind of it kind of made sense after he left and you know he talked about this vision that dusty had for the character you know he wanted to be this cool kind of suave badass sitting outside of you know the viper room leather jackets just a cool guy but then vince turns around and turns the and now he's talking to plants like <laughs> what <laughs> just to go off your part because i probably, mitch the plant with the freedom with jericho yes but here's my thing and i'll add on to what you said because you you told it beautifully my friend it would say mix of like i'm gonna be suave and cool like you mentioned like the viper and pitch like the black leather jacket but what they kind of did was very comedic of okay here's an influence of a brian pillman loose cannon which one of dean ambrose's influence was brian pillman but we're gonna make it comedic as fuck and like yeah, just go off to the comedy route. So it's like, it's a mix of serious with comedy, but comedy kind of overshadowed the serious part of it. Yeah, it definitely did. Um, I always thought Dean Ambrose was pretty cool, but uh, when he debuted and um, confronted Jericho at the end of uh, that pay-per-view, um, just the, the crowd reaction and just everything was just like, damn, this is going to be good. And, um, you know, eventually he started doing things and you got to really see who he was. I was happy for him because he seemed happy. Um, even though he's, you know, bleeding everywhere and, you know, hurting people. Uh, he seemed genuinely happy. Uh, even now he, he, he seems happy, even though he's beating the crap out of people relentlessly. Uh, I, I thought it was great. It, it's, it's cool to see John Moxley. I mean, I know a lot of people are, kind of hoping for him to go back to Dean Ambrose. Uh, I'm not one of those people. I enjoy John Moxley thoroughly. Well, first of all, sometimes you got to bust some skulls, number one, get the blood flowing, if you will. Sometimes you got to, you know, keep their heads ringing like Dr. Dre. Ring, ding, dong, ding, 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 ding,
what's well, hard. So, we, <laughs> so we have that type of interaction there. And I will say this, I, I like the John Moxley character and I like Dean Ambrose as a whole. I like the human being, but I was going to say, if he ever decided, Hey man, I may be one more run in the WWE do like Cody, keep the entrance, keep the music. You don't need to go back to the Dean Ambrose run. He should just come back as John Moxley, similar to how Cody did at WrestleMania. You have such authenticity with this character. I mean, here's a guy like John Moxley was trained by the legendary Les Thatch. You also trained guys like Nigel McGuinness and so many different wrestlers. If you want to make a TNA reference, Shark Boy. But he's a guy that's just learned the tools, the fundamentals. He's been around guys like William Regal, which we saw at the Blackpool Combat Club. So there's someone who's very mm-hmm. oriented in his style. And I mean, you, Nicola McDonald over here, you like the blood. You like smashing skulls. Maybe listen to some Jethro Tull. What were your thoughts on John Moxley coming to AEW, man? Yeah, okay, I've made this worse than myself. Smashing skulls. I only do that after, you know, Demon Hour, but and wherever. Anyway, <laughs> I liked watching his evolution. He's someone who, as soon as he left WWE, why would they make him talk to a plant? He when was he's not- that been talented. So he was nuts. The story at the time, he was feuding with Chris Jericho on no, the I just know that, but, yeah, but I just meant, what were they thinking? Why would they give someone as talented as that and say, hey, here's a plant, talk to it for an hour? It's the plan. It's no. the plan. Whoever come up with that, no. Yeah. Just, you I'll need you, to be slapped. I'll give you one <laughs> guess, pal. We're going to have him talk oh, to never the plan. And his name is Mitch. Yeah. Ah. Um, uh, I won't say anything else because I know I'll get in trouble again. It's such um, good shit. It's such <laughs> good shit. Go ahead, Nicola. John Moxley. No, I am um, Moxley. I love watching Moxley. He is unique. I love watching him walk through the crowd. I love his entrance. I love the fact that he bleeds almost every time he's in the ring, even though recently he hasn't. Twice, I think. Am I right? Maybe not. Okay, I think we're up to we're up to three matches now. Oh, yeah, no three bl- matches now. No, but no yeah, blood in three matches. I know what that's not right, but yeah, no. Um, every time he's in the ring, I just kind of the same like when you said about, yeah, no, exactly the same. Yeah, I like watching him. I like you know, he's gonna. I always have this gut feel. I'm like, you know, when he's gonna win, and then you get pissed off when he doesn't, but yeah, no, he's up on one of, one of my favorites as well. I like Moxley, and I have I do scream a lot about that. I've got to stop shouting a lot. That's so we'll, demoness, not me. <laughs> so we'll get back to my <coughs> but before this, we had Chris Jericho. What I like about Jericho is if you remember the time period, the list was very big when he left his departure from WWE. He left in late 2017. He comes into 20, 20, 2018. Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega. It's the big thing at the Tokyo Dome. U.S. title was on the line. He had the feud with Kenny Omega. He bet to beat Tetsuya Naito for that IWG Intercontinental Championship. He had the run as the pain maker in New Japan. 2019 comes. Here we are. Boom. AEW is on the rise, and here comes Chris Jericho and wins the matchup, becomes the first ever AEW champion, beating that hangman Adam Page. Uh, Jericho was really an integral part of what we saw getting TV deals and being one of the star powers of where AEW is today. So I want to ask you, Mr. Robert Davis, the Ayatollah of rock and roll, the sexy beast, baby, Y2J Chris Jericho, if you will, the pain maker, you know, the demo god, the this god, the that god, the sex gods, the champion Chris Jericho. Yeah. What were your thoughts on Chris Jericho coming to AEW? You know, it was interesting because his last uh, run in WWE was really good. He had, you know, a lot going for him. And uh, you know what happens when you got a lot going for you? You just made the list. You just made the list. That was such an awesome gimmick, and he had so much going for him. And he decides to, I'm, I'm taking off. It's just like, okay, what's uh, what's what's old uh, Christopher gonna do now? So then he shows up in New Japan around this time. Uh, you know, us, our little group of uh, people, TSK, if you will, um, we're getting into New Japan and we're kind of watching things unfold. And um, we actually watched uh, Naito and Jericho live. It was like three or four in the morning, um, but nonetheless, we watched it and it was a great match. And um, just to see him just pop up in AEW, it was just kind of like, we were just kind of like, oh, so I guess he's not going to WWE. He was one of those that we thought was going to be a lifer. He was going to retire in WWE, uh, kind of so on and so forth. But uh, 
being the man of reinvention that he is, he kind of uh, he kind of threw us threw us all for a curveball. And um, you know, as much as I was rooting for Hangman to be the first champion, uh, I, I think it was the right call to have Jericho be the first champion because uh, he brought a lot of eyes to the product by doing so. And he brought a little bit of the bubbly, is what he brought too, as well. A little bit of the bubbly. Oh, didn't bring the he didn't bring the list. Uh, and he well, he forgot the oh, title. Bubbly, that was it. Oh yeah, yeah, and the title that went missing in the airport. He forgot, yeah, the, okay. title in limo. He forgot the title in the list. Oh, that was it, limo. Yeah. Oh, oh Chris. Uh, well, going how going did you lose belts. He's going out, going out for a victory stake, and yeah. and, and he oh, loses yeah. the title. Did or maybe think? it was just he was looking at the bubbly bottles and thinking, yeah, that's interesting. And hang on, let's go. Well, Leave the belt behind. It's not like when he became the first ever undisputed champion WF where he talks about being at the hotel and he eats friggin' cold dominoes in his in his hotel room and then the pizza drops on the floor and it's like, oh wait, I can't eat this now. So the undisputed champion having cold dominoes pizza in his hotel room. Like he goes from that to now a little bit of the bubbly. So we've seen the trajectory of old Christopher's career. And now you over there, because I know you're a Jericho Holic, Miss Nicola McDonald. You're a Jericho Holic. You're one of the Jericho appreciators, if you will. What were your thoughts on why 2J Chris Jericho? late champion with his list what were your thoughts um so i was not the biggest fan of his in wwe but he grew on me and then i actually learned the words to half his songs so whenever he was live i'd know the songs which i i think made tsk funny because they were like what and i was like i still don't know i I know him now i learned them all now (laughs) but yeah i liked watching what he did and i like I didn't, like I said, in WWE, I was like, no, not too keen. But then, like I said, he's grown on me now. And now every time he comes out, I just sit there and start shouting again. Uh, Yeah, but um, I like him and I like his list because it's just funny because everyone's got a list for something or another, don't they? So, you know. You've got a list too, don't you? (laughs) You don't want to (laughs) know. Many. But I know which list you're talking about, yes. Yeah. That's a very long one. That is a very long one. You've got one too. I do. I do. Mm. I think Mike t- has ones too, but not in the sense that we do. I, I do. Yeah. All right. We'll put it like this. I am like the one and only <laughs> Steve Buscemi and Billy Madison. Just people to kill. Just cross it off with the lipstick and then here in telephone lines by <laughs> they get in the background. <laughs> By ELO, good old electric light orchestra, folks. Put on some telephone lines. Just put the lipstick on. That's me. Oh, yes. Oh, God. That's such a great... Oh, you look pretty in lipstick. He did bring in Steve Buscemi. Just like, sure, it's no problem. You want to go get some coffee sometime? Oh, hey, that's great. I guess I'll see you around. Sure. Then cross (laughs) us off the list. Why not? Go for it. But anyway, lists aside, folks, I, I will say this when it comes to good old Y2J, Chris Jericho. I mean, it gave us the inner circle with Sammy Guevara and Jake Hager, and he likes his hat. And it gave us so many great people from Santana and Ortiz who are now both back in AEW. So you see the transition from the inner circle. But also John Moxley comes into this because John Moxley beats Chris Jericho for that AEW World Championship. And he becomes the champion of a certain era, if you will, the champion of the pandemic era. Now, with its inception comes good things, but then there was bad things because there's no people. They did the most that they can by having the wrestlers in the crowd, much like WWE did, and just no audiences. Cody Rhodes, that infamous start, talking about, hey, you know, we're going through some turbulent times, so let's entertain you, put some smiles on people's faces, and let's have a dog on good show. John Moxley is the champion during this era, and I'll start with you, Robert, on this one. John Moxley, the champion of the pandemic era, faced the likes of the late great Brody Lee, faced the likes of MJF. Eddie Kingston, and so on and so forth, and Kenny Omega. What were your thoughts on the John Moxley pandemic era run, the champion of the pandemic, John Moxley? Man, I, I, I got to be honest. I, I almost want to say this was my my favorite era. Um, like you said, it brought on a lot. Um, you know, the whole story with Mox and Brody, um, you know, it was just great to see Brody because having been a fan of what he did in WWE, I always felt like, man he he this is this isn't this isn't it like there's so much more to him behind what is being portrayed here um you know he he's not out there talking in a southern accent you know even though he's from upstate new york um 
you know, that was probably one of my favorite matches um, during that era. But even during this whole pandemic era, you know, you had wrestlers in the crowd. This, I think, was our introduction to the Ass Boys. Uh, yes. In the crowd at uh, Daly's Place every week. That was always such an entertaining part. Like, they definitely shined through that um, era. Uh, Hikaru Shida being champion um, was another highlight. I, I think she did phenomenal um, during that reign as well. Um, but I think Mox, Mox was probably my, has probably been my favorite uh, AEW champion so far, just because there was so much uncertainty during these, uh, this time. And um, I think he just went out there and delivered every single match, every single time. And Nicola, as we talk about with the pandemic era, uh, John Moxley on top against Brody Lee. Yeah, 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 yeah. The exalted one of the Dark Order joined the Dark Order. We got, yeah, there it is. There you go, Rob. But yeah, no, that I, was. I, got, oh, I have to do it one handed because I'm holding a phone. So I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm doing it in my mind. So there you go. Um, telepath. <laughs> telepath. <laughs> so good, Nicola. John Moxley, the pandemic era. Uh, Still out of the wrestlers in the crowd. Then they started slowly bringing back people in there. Yeah. We had Cody Rhodes doing it for America against Anthony Agogo. Wake me up before you go go. What were your thoughts mm -hmm. of the pandemic era? <laughs> we'll get back to that. What were your thoughts about the pandemic era <laughs> with John Moxley as champion? I liked it. I think at the time everything was uncertain. Like you said, there was a lot of well, crazy time and they obviously had to hold everything together themselves while they were in that ring and doing what they were doing. But, yeah, I like, I did like it. And uh, I think it kept everyone sane for a little while as well. Seeing wrestling kind of kept us all stable for a little while. Does that make sense? Because it wasn't exactly a fun time. But to watch him come up, yeah, that was amazing. And he's a badass for it as well. well yeah, I want one of his leather jackets. That's how bad it is. <laughs> Well, it's a badass leather jacket. I mean, I'll go off your point here. It, it was tough for everybody because, again, no people, but also at the same time, like I'll say it right now, when you're watching Raw and Raw is a three-hour show, folks, and there's nobody there, it's just silence. It, it, it's hard. And you're watching AEW and that, there's more. It adds to it. It must have been so horrible, though. I mean, we're, like you, we've all said, we yeah. weren't, there was a lot of things going on for us on the outside, but for them, to perform and there's no one there. Nope. I can't imagine and how messed up. Literally that was. nobody watching. Right. Yeah. Like and they all knew that we're watching from obviously our TVs, but not actually physically hearing the cheers, the screams, the like all of it. It must have messed them up a lot. Oh, so yeah, it must have been totally. really hard on them. As, yeah. as as somebody who's a performer, that crowd engagement is everything. And when you take that away, you take away from the performance. And that yeah. just makes things so much harder. I mean, I, I can't imagine being up, you know, on stage with my band and playing to absolutely nobody. That would just yeah. be absolutely absurd. And, I, you know, I can't imagine what they were going through performing yeah. to, you know, I mean, their peers, obviously. But uh, to have a whole stadium empty, that's just wild. Yeah, that was, I think, the main thing for it. But then they still like, pulled it off anyway, as if everyone was still there. But then, obviously, no cheers. So that I think I said that a few times. It's like, it just sucks to watch them doing so amazing. They can't hear because we're not allowed outside or whatever. Yeah. It, it was kind of wild that they even got away from Daly's place for a while and they had to go to uh, mm. QT's gym, which is literally just probably probably no bigger than uh you know like a high school gym and uh they're running dynamite out of this freaking you know just space and and it was still fantastic well, that's the thing it also motivates them to put on a great product and i mean for wwe that time they had the thunderdome aew is bringing more people in yeah. but again it, it's tough just for the fact of and i mean also there's a lot of people who can you use who's getting COVID, who's not getting COVID. and i mean what we also got during this time and i mentioned it earlier we're laughing with cody rhodes taking on taking on the brits you know because we got our beef over there in the uk for doing it for america and the american dream against anthony agogo and you got friggin' Orange Cassidy, the best friends, feuding with uh, Kip Sabian and the now dubbed Best Man Miro over video games. So, I mean, it gave us some peculiar storylines, but interest, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Interest, if you will. 
Uh, d- uh, definitely some interest. Um, the Gubna and Gubna. Um, Cody Rhodes was definitely was definitely something. Um, you know, I definitely had some respect for. Well, I mean, I still do uh, some respect to for you know Gogo for coming in you know being a boxer and deciding to give wrestling a try and you know he's uh he's blind in one eye is that, is that right yes yeah um being able to come in and do that that's you know absolute respect for that that whole feud with cody though oh boy probably not one of the better things during this time but mad respect to him Nicola, America, what were your thoughts on Anthony Ogogo? I love the oh. way you said the governor. <laughs> nice. So that's who the he governor. is. He, yeah. It's the governor. I know. Anthony Ogogo. I know. I know. I know. It's just funny when, yeah. <laughs> um, right, ask, ask the question again. Sorry, my brain went to fog because I was okay. giggling at him. We'll start with the governor. Blaming you over there. <laughs> well, your fault, Robert, with your governor over here. Uh, doing it for America. Um, America. <laughs> Anthony and Gogo. Wake, wake me up before. Fuck yeah. Wake me up. Fuck before, yeah. Fuck yeah. Wake me up. Before, <laughs> wake me up before you a go go. What were your thoughts on Anthony and Gogo and Cody Rhodes? That disastrous weigh in, and then the match happens. Cody wins with the freaking vertebraker out of nowhere. All right. What were your thoughts on Cody and a go go, Nicola? irritating to watch really irritating and it looked it was just bodged the whole thing was bodged it was like nothing made sense and i can't believe i'm saying this i was actually bored and i apologize for that but yeah i did not get into that match at all that's all right i mean we also then had our like i mentioned orange cassie and the best friends against the debuting miro the best man kip sabian and you know damn it mom they broke our video games and we're feuding over video games and twitch and whatnot so i'll start with the lady on this what were your thoughts on these gamers that being miro and kip sabian against orange cassie and the best friends what were your thoughts on that feud um <laughs> i'm a massive fan of orange cassie so um yeah i uh I liked it, and uh, it did make a lot of sense. I'm not 100% on gamers, even though you know I live with one. Oh, my son's a gamer. But, yeah, it took me a lot to understand what the hell was going on, not being, like I said, into computer games and stuff like that as much as they are. But it was interesting. I liked it, and, yeah, there we go. Roberto, what were your thoughts on Nerds R Us and the feud over the video games? Nerds R Us. (laughs) (laughs) Well, as a gamer myself mm. um it, it was a bit different um i wasn't the biggest fan of kip sabian um when he debuted oh yeah me neither <laughs> no you weren't no none, none i don't think any of us were no i uh, hate it too no. <laughs> to be honest um when it so, made it kept shouting Beet- beetlejuice rung and asked for his trousers back yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. can't confirm she did that and uh still continues to do that <laughs> but uh when kip uh-huh. came in it was just like bro what are you doing who are you why um th- then he got this whole gamer thing and it was just like okay this is at least it's something uh he brought in miro and um i think every week we were yelling for miro to kill kip uh and nicola can confirm that <laughs> i can confirm that yeah, yeah we, we were, were all doing it yeah, we were all kind of tired of Kip at this point. Um, then he went away for a while. Uh, we were all pretty happy about that. When he came back, yeah. this new gimmick, he, um, well, after he took the box off his head and kind of stopped playing with that, uh, this Mad Hatter kind of deal, I mean, I, I kind of got into it. I, I kind of like it. But uh, the whole thing with Miro and uh, him and, you know, Miro almost killing Kip, like, we were pretty happy about that, I, I think. We were excited about that. Um, you know, we've been hoping for uh, some resolution to that story because uh, they kind of haven't come back around yet now that uh, Miro is back and uh, he's healed up and uh, doing things, forsaking people, uh, mostly his hot, flexible wife. It was, uh, it, it, was, it was a strange introduction to Miro and uh, Kip, uh, but it kind of seems like the both of them have kind of found their footing now. Thank God. 
Hot and flexible wife, CJ Perry. Mm, 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 mm. Okay, so we go from <laughs> we go from Nerds R Us, which again, I'm joking, folks. Also, if you want to talk about a worse storyline than this, Edge and Booker T for the fake Japanese commercial back in 2002 at WrestleMania 18. Just to get two guys on the card, they're feuding over a stupid Japanese commercial for shampoo. That makes no goddamn sense. So there's been worse, folks, than fighting over video games um so we go from the video game storyline the transformation of mirror to what we see now and there's a lot of people coming in as well and i mean kenny omega also was very much on the rise a much needed heel turn him and hangman page were the tag champions you got to see some great tag team action but then kenny omega who wanted a 69 don Callis, becomes the aew world heavyweight champion and we get lines like that and we get just kenny omega dressing much like the nick bockwinkle if you will from the 80s and what we had there from that standpoint being the cleaner if you will kenny omega and you will hear that battle cry god damn it so i'll start with uh, the ultimate kenny omega fan appreciator that is robert davis over here roberto kenny omega is the champion he's a heel he hears the battle cries he wants the 69 don what were your thoughts on kenny omega as aew world's heavyweight champion uh, honestly it was like yes uh, all is all is well in the world again um i i know Coming from New Japan, uh, maybe the American crowd wasn't too familiar with who he was, and um, they got to finally see who he was. Uh, the addition of Don Callis, uh, Donathan Callis, was uh, it was it was interesting. Uh, you know, we all know Don Callis, um, you know, from TNA and Impact, uh, the stuff he did there uh, on commentary. We know him before that as well as uh, the Jackal. And uh, other things as well. Uh, that was that was that was a good run. I enjoyed Kenny's first run. Um, it brought a lot of good matches. There was one match that kind of stands out. I, I think it was a fatal four way. I want to say it was Pac, Orange Cassidy, Kenny, and uh, Jungle Boy, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Huh? That that was a, a fantastic match. You really had no idea who was going to win. There was there was points in that match where you thought Orange Cassidy was going to be AEW world champion. Um, Kenny just put on some of the, probably the best matches in AEW history as he continues to do so. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely ready for uh, reign number two. All right. Now I got to put this out there because you did mention Don Callis as the Jackal in the WF at the time with the oddities, if you will. He was yes. also another name. He was an ECW, the original ECW as Cyrus, the Cyrus, virus. the virus, not to be confused with Brodus Clay and TNA. His name was Tyrus. Who was now what, 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 what was his name? His name was Tyrus. His, his, his name was Tyrus. So, Cyrus, the virus, Don Callis, we go in 69. Him, and we're going to have Kenny by God Omega. As the AEW World's Heavyweight Champion. Now, Nicola, your thoughts on Kenny Omega? Did you feel that battle cry under the desert sky? The one wing angel flies. Are you ready to go? Are you ready for this? What were your thoughts on Kenny Omega? <laughs> Champion? I've always been a, I've always been a fan of Kenny Omega. So his first run, like Robert said, was cool. The only part that I will admit was was I am not a fan of a certain Don Callis whatsoever. So that's why I was growling every time someone meant. But yeah, that's just my opinion, and I know obviously that's what he does. But yeah, I'm kind of glad Kenny's away from him right now. But yeah, watching him rise, and he's a legend, an icon in himself. No matter what he does, he always comes up on top. Unless you know, I like his heel. T- I liked him being the bad guy. I liked the crazy outfits they wore, all the eighties stuff, and. Yeah, every time he's in the ring, you know he's going to destroy someone. So, yeah. And I love watching him rise. And I want to see him do it again. So, the same as Robert. I'm looking forward to seeing what he does now. But without the the Don Callis one, it should be, you know, hit on the head a couple more times. So, that's just my opinion. What also kind of ties into this, guys? Like, you mentioned him being a commentator for Impact. Uh, it was very short-lived, and we saw AEW mostly dominate over there with AEW. I mean, we had Kenny Omega beating guys like Chris Swan, Sammy Callahan with OVE, Ohio versus Everything, Everything. Yes, uh, I really was, like them. Me too, mm-hmm. me too. But I'll start with the Impact fan over here, Nikola. Kenny Omega, the AEW Impact partnership that we saw. We got to see people go over there like Matt Hoddy. We saw Kazarian go over there. We saw a lot of people intertwine over there. Christopher Daniels from AEW. Uh, What were your thoughts on the Impact AEW relationship and the matches that we got with Kenny Omega and Rich Swan and Sammy Callahan? 
like I said, I was a big OVE fan, so I was a big fan of Sammy, so as well, and still am to this day. That's not changed. But um, I liked the duo. I thought it was pretty cool because I was hoping to see a lot more matches, but not just with the males, with the females as well. So that was interesting for me. But I didn't realise Matt Hardy went over there. He did. He did. Oh, not okay. For, not, yeah. not for very long. I, I think he went yeah. as uh, Big Money Matt, didn't he? It was Matt Hardy in private. Oh, yeah. Yep. When he running around in his suits again. Yes. Yeah. Right, Nobody so understands yeah. how hard it is to be Matt Hardy. Yes, bringing it back to the old Matt Hardy brand where they have the cue cards. All right. Yes, Robert Davis. I like your style, sir. Yes. Okay. <laughs> he is so entertaining. <laughs> Roberto, now we had the uh, relationship with AEW and Impact. By the way, when it comes to OVE, thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, what were your thoughts? <laughs> what were your thoughts? <laughs> Oh my God, what were your thoughts on the AEW Impact relationship? Kenny Omega up in there, in there like swimwear. One of the highest buys for an AEW pay per view with Kenny Omega and Rich Swan in the main event. What were your thoughts, mate? I was actually going to mention that uh, that Rich Swan and Kenny Omega was a fantastic match, and with it being uh, one of the highest buys, I mean, it, it was definitely deserving of that. Uh, I was kind of in the in the same boat with uh, Nicola, uh, but then again, I'm I'm always in the boat with Nicola for some reason. Um, <laughs> having it would have been cool to see some of the women crossover, like to have Jordan Grace come over, um, even Diona Perazzo, like Perazzo versus Britt Baker. How 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 fire would that have been? Um, I've got and, one: Rosemary versus Abaddon. Hey, that's what I would have liked to have seen in in, in a cage with fire yeah yeah that, that yeah would've... and a lot of weapons yeah that, that... would have been there mm, mm, mm. Mm. we can Ooh, still get okay, we, we we can still get it we we put it out there into the world <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> uh but uh i i think there is so much potential for the women's roster to actually uh to intertwine and intermingle um you know you've got like jordan grace versus nyla rose uh, that would have been, I think, a fun match to watch. Um, Kaz, Franklin, Kazarian just kind of went over and uh, stayed, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yep. That was, um, yep. you know, that was good for him. I, I think that's that was a good spot for him. Uh, SCU was always very SCU. much you, uh, very much a standout tag team. Uh, I, I thought they were great in Ring of Honor. Having them come into AEW was, I think, a great move. Um, but happy to see where Kaz is at now. Uh, hopefully, it's not over. Hopefully, we can get some more intermingling. Um, you know, I, I'd like to see a reunion of the North. Um, yeah. To have Ethan Page and Josh Alexander kind of come back together, I thought they were a fantastic tag team. Um Mox and Sammy Callahan together. Oh, yep. dangerous! What was that? Their, what was their? Uh, I, I forget the name of their tag team. What was it? Oh, it was the conspiracy something? Switchblade. Oh, okay. Switchblade Switch Switch conspiracy. conspiracy. Yes. yes. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I think. I think a little reunion would would be uh, very nice. I mean, they teased that in Impact very briefly. Like, they had it before Madman Fulton. Everybody was thinking that Moxley was going to go to Impact and join with Sammy Callahan, like, very briefly. They, they, there was a little tease there. Yeah, there was a little tease there. And, uh, you know, I think that would have been pretty cool. I mean, hopefully the door's not shut on that. I, I know Scott Demore's down. I know Tony is down. Um, hopefully we can get another run of uh, intermingling, if you will. Gotta say, what we're being introduced to, folks, if you hear on Roberto Davis' side, there's cars going by, and I'm constantly reminded of the great song by Tom Cochran, Life is a Highway, I want to ride it on my own. I digress. I look at <laughs> All right, which version's better, the original Tom Cochran or Rascal Flats from the Cars movie? I've got a Tom Cochran. Ooh, that's a tough one, but I, I'll probably go the original version. How about you, Nicola, Tom Cochran or Rascal Flats? The original as well. <laughs> OG, baby. Okay. Now, on the side note with Frankie, OG. 
Yeah, oh, <laughs> shit, so original baby. All right. So Franklin, Ka- Franklin Kazarian. I'm going to start doing you now, Franklin. Franklin. Kaz- Frank- Frankie Kazarian <laughs> over there in Impact. Um, congratulations are in order because you're bound for glory. It has been announced so far that Mike Tanay, Don West, rightfully so, are going in the Impact Hall of Fame along with Frankie Kazarian's wife, Miss Tracy Brooks, one of the oh. original knockouts. Awesome. Yes. Good. Good for that. Good for her. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Stop clapping for me. I have no use of my hands right now. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I think that's that's really cool because Tracy's one of the OG knockouts and Mike Tanay and Don West, legendary, legendary announced team for TNA for all those years. Um, But yes, on that note as well, we move from the AEW Impact relationship, so to speak, and then we move on on out, moving on up to Hangman Adam Page coming back with some cowboy shit. And then he beats Kenny Omega oh, after times. Yes, for the AEW World's Heavyweight Championship. He has that reign. We'll talk about the guy that beat him. And we're going to try to exclude the profanity, but I know there's going to be a lot of profanity <laughs> when we get to him. Um, <laughs> and, of course, we're going to talk about other stuff here, folks. But the profanity will remain. Oh, my goodness. But um, Hangman Adam Page, he wins the championship from Kenny Omega. You know, comes out on the horse. He's riding on that horse. He's not running up that hill. He's riding out on that horse. And, well, he wins a championship. He has his run. A lot of people have questioned that run. Was it good? Was it bad? Was it, you know, whatever. But people are very critical on many things of professional wrestling. So I'll start with Nico this time because I know you're about that cowboy shit. You want to ride on that horse. You want to run up that hill. What were your thoughts on <laughs> Hangman Adam Page winning that World's Heavyweight Championship, dog on it, with some cowboy shit from Kenny Omega and his run as the champ? Go ahead. I was happy because at the time I think uh... – Kenny Omega, even though I'm a massive fan, I was happy he got in the first place. He was getting on my nerves by that point. And I was behind Hangman Page in a big way. So every time he, obviously, real cowboy shit, clearly. (laughs) But I was happy to see him win, and he won. He deserved it as well. He really, really, really kicked Kenny's ass. So, yeah, that was impressive. I liked watching that one. Yeah. And the overall title run. And he was. Of what? Of, uh, Hangman Page's of title Kenny. run. Oh, right, yeah. Um, I liked it, but then he got annoying as well. So I was glad when he lost it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the choice, the, the, the purpose, and the overall general consensus here is don't annoy Nikola, and your title <laughs> run will just be fine. And if you annoy Nikola, the title run is just done. It's in jeopardy. It's it is, lost. It's lost. It's gone. It's a lost cause. Fuck you and your title reign. You're annoying me. That's what it is. Here's what it is. And I, I, you know, you're not even saying it, oh, but I can tell you it with your face. You just want to kick somebody in the dick. That's what it is. You just want to <laughs> kick them because they annoy you. Kick people. Yeah, probably. All right, okay, I admit to that, but there's so many other things. But, yeah, we'll, we'll stick to the uh, more humane side of things. So you'll go kick in the dick right now. <laughs> I'm just saying, man, you, you you motion your foot. Hashtag motion your foot. When it comes to Nicola, <laughs> use that hashtag, folks. Hashtag you know motion. What? I sound like a, I know I'm mental and crazy in reality, but I actually sound worse on here. But, hey, okay. Bye. It's, a, it's a good crazy, though. It's a good crazy, though. We all I know. Need- I know, I know. Yeah, it's true. Uh, is she still at Wembley or did you call her back? No, she's back with me right now. Okay. All right. Long Only distance. because. The other idiot left there, so yeah. <laughs> her, so, so her purpose is some, uh, kind of been returned home. <laughs> Somebody's dick has been spared <laughs> from, from a kicking. <laughs> Hashtag dick sparing. Robert Davis, your thoughts on Hangman out of page? <laughs> and his oh, running. wow. <laughs> Sorry. What a, what a, what a story. Uh, what a conclusion to a very epic story. Um, you know, there was always, um, you kind of mentioned this already, but there, there's people that are always critical when it comes to things in wrestling. And um, the biggest critique, I guess, AEW had around this time that there was no long-term storytelling. Hell, there's no storytelling at all. Um, it's just a bunch of random matches strung together, apparently. Um, but I think the overall story of Kenny and Hangman was probably one of, if, uh, I don't want to say if not, because they've got some pretty good things going on now. Um, but at the time, it was probably one of the best storylines that they had. And, um, you know, I, I probably think it would have concluded sooner, uh, given Mr. Hangman. Uh, Cowboy shit became a dad. So he did take some time off for that. Um, 
it probably would have concluded a lot sooner. But I know Kenny was also pretty banged up. Um, the man needed a whole new uh, everything. Um, he gave uh, dear sister over here, or whatever side she's on, um, a call for some new organs. Uh, Kenny needed Kenny. Kenny was Kenny was hurt. Kenny was in bad shape. So I, I think this was the perfect opportunity for him to be uh, written off for a while while he had those surgeries and got better and um, became the Kenny that we all know and love. Um, I thought his, I thought Hangman's overall title reign was okay. I thought it could have been better. I do think there was some booking opportunities there. Um, it, it's going to get interesting in the next couple of minutes because we're getting ready to talk about a certain individual that is not very liked by myself or Nicola. I mean, uh, not myself either, but I, I, I see both sides. And I'm not, I don't, first of all, I think you both know we don't take sides. We just call it as we see it. And we're going to call it as we <laughs> see it <laughs> in about a moments here, folks. But before we get to, uh, you know, Pepsi is my drink of choice. Um, well, I don't have a Pepsi right now. I have a cheer wine. Oh. Oh, hey! Yeah! Just it's Robert, as I've got a glass of water, which is like, it's after midnight. It has to be water. Oh, Pepsi and cheer wine. Mm. The Carolina's drink, baby. Pepsi and cheer wine over here. Boom. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Get you some cheer wine. Cherry soda, baby. Anyway, digress. Product oh, placement God. aside here, folks. Product placement <laughs> aside. Um, we did have, before we get to that guy who likes to plunge his Pepsi, uh, let's talk about Maxwell. <laughs> that sounds so wrong, but it felt so right. There's <laughs> 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 a dab on that bitch. Boom. So, channel my inner TJ. You sound as bad as me now, so I don't feel as bad as I did a minute ago. <laughs> so, so, we get to this guy from Long Island. His name is Maxwell Jacob Friedman. Uh, rise such um to such heights in um in uh, AEW from the pinnacle and just be in that dastardly heel. I'm gonna manipulate you, then I'm gonna screw you. Um, rises to prominence and becomes AEW champion that we see now. His tag team better than you, baby. With Adam Cole's really taken into high grain and just going right off the friggin' road and boom, putting that shit into drive and really killing it from a comedic standpoint and show a different personality with MJF. But now, around this time period in 2021, he was not a happy camper. He wanted his money. He went over into the ring and said, hey, Tony, fire me, you fucking Mark. Live on television. He was pissed. No he show. sure did. Ruined that Wardlow match and just got squashed like a bug. Oh, my goodness. What were your thoughts on the whole MJF angle? Robert Davis, we'll start with you, you fucking Mark. Go ahead. Uh, me and the boys, the TSK boys, uh... We were actually we were actually live in the house because that dynamite was at the forum here in Los Angeles. So uh, we we got to see that firsthand, and uh, that was like whoa. Um, y- you would almost expect him to get booed, and it was the complete opposite. They were actually cheering MJF, and uh, any time that Tony got mentioned during the show. Um, or af- even after the show, he just got booed severely. And it was just kind of like, oh, shit. How did he do that? <laughs> um, but that that Wardlow match um, was really kind of weird. Um, I know as we were watching it in the TSK uh, Discord, we were just really confused by it because, you know, Max did get squashed. But this was supposed to be Wardlow's kind of... Coming, coming out. out coming out moment his grand uh you know i'm free from the shackles of this asshole that i just killed um that's getting stretchered out and um it wasn't they were talking about max not showing to that autograph signing or whatever um he you know showed a couple of things that weekend and um the talk was kind of on that so it was just kind of like Damn, we feel kind of bad for Wardlow because this should be his moment and it's not. But, you know, uh, Max kind of did some things with a certain individual we're getting ready to talk about. I, so, I know we, we, keep, we keep delaying the inevitable. Um, I'm, I'm glad this show is not uh, censored because it's about to get dirty. So <laughs> when you talk about free from the shackles now, 
Robert Davis, you and I were both religious. And I mean, I've heard you were religious, but I got to put this out there. When you talk about free from the shackles, it reminds me of that Mary Mary classic from 2000. Take the shackles off my feet so I can dance. I want to praise you. I want to praise you. Is that what it is? It's kind of like Mary Mary, right? Yes, exactly like Mary Mary. Uh, Wardlow was uh, definitely dancing. Did did Kirk did he, was he like Kirk Franklin? Did he want a revolution? Whoop whoop as well. Whoop whoop. He whoop. wanted a revolution. That he did. Sick and tired on my brothers killing each other. Now we go over to this fucking mark over here, Nicola McDonald. What were your thoughts on MJF and that whole bizang from 2021? When he first came in, I didn't like him, but then he again grew on me. But it's his attitude, the way he is, his actual like the whole character of him. I really like him now, and he just he's. Because of the fact that he does the whole arsehole and then he goes into comedy and then he goes into like, oh, I'm genuine and I like people, even though in the same sense he's a total arsehole at the same time. I, uh, yeah, he, uh, I've loved watching his reign and I do like the fact that him and Adam Cole are the tag team champs, whatever. But at the same time, I can't wait to see him detach because I really want to see Cole beat his ass. But that was just my <coughs> sorry. Um, but yeah, I uh, I'm looking forward to that. I want to see the turn because that's been exciting. And the whole time I'm sitting there going, just kick him in the face, please, please hit him, please do this. And then they hug and I just sit there going, oh yeah, okay, maybe next week then. Nicola, but, has yeah, been, I'm... Nicola has been anticipating a dick kick from either Cole <laughs> or MJF. No, nope. and they have no, not deli- they have not delivered. No, they haven't. Shit, what's going on? That's that's not what I'm laughing about. I'm just laughing like, because he's an asshole. And then, you know, he's nice. And then he's an asshole again. But I also, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on it. I'm going to speak on it. As, yeah. as, a, as a fellow Long Islander from <laughs> Long Island, oh, yeah. I have went to school with, and I've been around a lot of people that act like MJF. So I can speak on experience that yeah, not all like of us. That's why I said it. <laughs> not, not all of us are like that, and I don't put that there. But there's no. a lot of people from Long Island that do act like that. He grew up in Plainview, which is probably from where I live on Long Island, probably about a half an hour. So it's it's a very like richy Plainview, nice nice area, nice houses. It's like Great Neck, like where John Taffer came from. Remember John Taffer, freaking bar rescue, could clean this bar, wash your hands, shame on you. You know that whole nine with John Taffer. Remember that, Robert Davis? Mm-hmm. I, I do, I do. Rescue, yeah. You remember bar rescue, Nicola? I think so, vaguely. John Taft just yelling Thank at people you. in the bars. Oh, well, there's going to be a lot of yelling here, folks. Well, not yelling, mm-hmm. but most of the pain because we're about to get to that point, folks. Where's my shiny toys? I mean, <laughs> well, sorry, carry on. <laughs> anyway, Long Island douchebags aside, with a side of Long Island iced tea, we come to the point of a douche from Chicago, if you will, Chi Town, <laughs> if you will, Chicago, Illinois. Um, CM Punk, Philip Brooks. PB, now I'm not talking about peanut butter and jelly sandwich, peanut butter, jelly time, where are you at? Where are you at? I'm talking about yeah, Phil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking, what? <laughs> We're talking about CM Punk. And CM, <laughs> CM Punk comes in the first dance. It's Rampage. He gets the match with Darby Allen. He's in there like swimwear. He's all over the place. He's spewing. He's having the matches with Eddie Kingston. He's all up in the mix. They're doing CM, FTR, the whole nine. Then he goes for that World's Heavyweight Championship. Um, Hangman Adam Page, the promo happens. It's right before the pay-per-view, the go-home show. Adam Page goes off script, which is a big no-no in professional wrestling. Talk about workers' rights, and you can see CM Punk's face is like, what, what, what the hell are you doing? What's going on here? And then we get to the <laughs> we get to the pay-per-view. He wins a title and whatnot. And then we get to the Moxley stuff. Loses the title to Moxley. The wins are right back in Chicago. Ace Steel fires him up like it's freaking Rocky Balboa and Mickey and Rocky Three, And he's going back to beat that asshole Clubber Lang. A pity the fool who goes against Clubber Lang in pain is the prediction of the might. And then we get to see him Punk winning it back from injury because he jumped off the stage like a dumbass. And, well, <laughs> it Can happened. Yes. The brawl, yeah. out, the brawl out happens. He's eating his muffins. He's just saying, I'm old, I'm tired, and I work with fucking children. And then he... Okay. Yeah, and then he comes back. And he's the real world's heavyweight champion. They give him his own show in Collision, and then he 
feuds with Samoa Joe, and then he feuds with Ricky Starks, and then we have the fight with Jungle Boy at all in, and then he beats Samoa Joe, and then he's fired. Okay, so here was the here was the original story. Jesus. So, so yeah, that, the, 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 how you put that? Wow. Yes. Yeah. Just- And this isn't a one-year time period, folks. This is a one-year time period. So it started with the hangman going off script because of the workers' rights. So the story going around, which was not true, and that's why Punk was mad. But again, this is stuff that could be held behind closed doors. He didn't need to say that live in front of the people. So he did. I know. I know. But he had to because that's him. So the the story... (laughs) I'm trying not to laugh because it's just so ridiculous. So the story comes out that uh, Cole Cabana, the reason why he's not on TV is because of CM Punk, which was not true. And Tony should have shut it down and released a statement like, hey, any of the reports. But he didn't. And then that led to Brawl Out and everything that went on there. Then CM Punk goes on friggin' live TV and shoots on Hangman Page months and months later. And he knows he's not in the building. And he just friggin' shoots his mouth off and then we get to the situation with all out and just everything was just a fuckery the fuckery was happening somebody called the fuckery department on all different sides it's just a mess and it's for the better now that tony finally made the decision to say hey i didn't want to do it but cm punk's gone tony got booed in chicago he sat there for six minutes and just sprouted about it and you know he was in fear of his life yada 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 it was a whole thing that a lot of people are criticizing tony khan for but it's like number one it's the wrestling business like vince mcmahon got knocked out and spit on by brett the hitman Hart back in 1997 and you want to talk yeah and you want to talk about being in fear of your life from this guy who just knocked over some monitors we don't know if he lunged on him we don't know if this thing goes to court first thing release the video and if the video comes out and we see cm punk choking him and lunging at the boss it's not going to look good for cm punk so robert we'll start with you this whole kerfluffle that yeah, there's a word for you, folks. This whole kerfluffle, that, this whole kerfluffle, this whole sh- chicanery, if you will, shenanigans. Freaking speaking legal up in here. Uh, we saw what happened. I mean, shitstorm. Shitstorm. Put it that way. You're gonna put it bluntly. I'm going the legal terms. You're just gonna say this shit is nuck and futz. To quote Dickie Roberts, former child star David Spade. I digress. That's, so, that's how I am in general. I'm just straight <laughs> up blunt sometimes. That's why we love gets you. Gets in trouble. I know, I know. But yeah. it also gets me in trouble. That's why we love you, though. That's why and, we love you. I know, love you too. I know. And I know, uh, like hot, hot damn was this a shit storm. Um, uh, I'll go a little bit further back. Um, I, I'm not the biggest fan of CM Punk. I uh, never really have been, um, to be honest. But when he came back and he debuted, I, <laughs> I was ha- I was happy to see him back. I was happy to see all you know his fans happy. Um, it was a historic thing for AEW. Uh, seven years gone from the business, he's back um, to do CM Punk things. I didn't know much about him before, uh, aside from what I've heard. I've seen a couple of his WWE matches. Absolutely not impressed. I, I didn't like anything from his WWE run. Uh, went back a little further and watched some Ring of Honor stuff. There's some pretty good stuff there. There was a dog collar match that was really good. Um but when he came back, you know, I, I was happy for everybody. Everybody was happy about it. We all expected uh, something different than what we got. We didn't get what we expected from him. And uh, it's a shame. And as much as I, I do not like this guy, um, the CM Punk character, seems too much like the Philip brooks person and that's just unfortunate um as much crap as everybody talks about him uh it's unfortunate that things ended the way they did uh you don't want to see somebody's career end on such a sour note if you will some people probably don't give a shit regardless um I'll get to my stuff afterwards because it actually involves a meeting I had with him, and I'll talk about my mommy as well. So, but I'll uh, I'll let Nico take the floor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But but yeah, ho- hopefully, um, you know, if this is if this is it for CM Punk, he got to go out in front of eighty one thousand people again. That is true. Show. That is very true, and with one of his best friends, that's correct. So you do have there's a positive lighting there. You put a little positivity on it. Like yeah. you're, all right. Now Still, Nico, fuck him. Fuck you. Go ahead. 
Um, right, yeah, sorry, I'll come back in a sec. Uh, where do I start? Uh, right, yeah, so I'm not a fan whatsoever. Never was. Every time I saw him, no matter where he was, I wasn't impressed. But I will not take away that he, isn't ta- he has a talent for wrestling. And that's to be fair to him. He's good in the ring. It's just his mouth. And like you said, when people are not in the same room as him, then he starts bitching. Then he starts doing the whole... I'm sorry to say this, I'm a brat or drama queen escapade. That's exactly what he does. And they did the same with Kenny Omega. He then did it again with um, Jack Perry or Jungie, Jack Perry. And then he uh, and then he got fired, which he should have done a long time ago. It should have happened before this had happened because there's two major previews that he's kicked off at. And one of them where I am as well, which, yeah, no, idiot, dickhead, nope, not impressive. And the best decision Tony made was getting rid of him. So, yeah, whatever he does now is down to him. But I hope he learns that your mouth is something you need to keep shut and just get on with it. So book- And not cause drama for other people. So Booker-, <laughs> <laughs> so Booker T once said, Hulk Hogan, we coming for you, Niggly. Haven't used that term in a while. Booker T, Hulk Hogan be coming for you, Nickley. Yep. When it comes to CM Punk in the UK, Nicola McDonald over here says, CM Punk be coming for you, Wanka. So on that side of the thing. Do you want me to say it? Do you want me to yeah. say it that way? We, yeah. CM Punk, we're coming for you, you Wanka. Uh, there so, we go. <laughs> so my thing is very interesting because I first met him in 2007. Oh, you. Yes. <laughs> I'll put the photo inserted here because it's on my Facebook. So I was 15, and this is when he was on the ECW roster, and he was feuding with Johnny, uh, John Morrison at the time. He'd come off of Johnny Nitro. I met him backstage, and I still have the signed T-shirts. I said, hey, I know, 15. Hey, CM Punk, can you sign my shirt, please? And he just looks at me and he goes, anywhere? And I'm like, right here, where your fist is on the T-shirt? So he signed it, but you could tell, like, he just he didn't want to be there. He wasn't – he was probably in a bad mood, which has become the – general consensus of his career being in a bad 24/7. mood. 24-7. 24-7. <laughs> um, so this guy's been in a bad mood for 18 years. years now. Years. And like you mentioned, CM Punk and Raven and the dog collar match. Go out and check that out if you haven't seen it. That's what Robert's talking about. Um, my mom didn't like him either. I mean, every time he used to come out, you know, you look in my eyes, what you see, the cult of personality. My mom used to switch up the lyrics and it would be, look in my eyes, what do you see? I got no personality. So my mom, I remember, and we used to sing that every time he would come out because my mom did not like CM Punk either. Uh, he's a required taste for, for people. I think he has the old school mindset. He's always talked about what would Harley Race do. He's been around the guys like Harley Race and Terry Funk and, you know, Eddie Guerrero. So he has a very old school mindset that's kind of very... You know, what we saw in the territory days to kind of what goes on with now is not necessarily the views of what we had back in the day. I will say this, though. If Mama Larkin doesn't like you. Yes. You need to evaluate stuff. Stuff. We'll get her back here in a minute, folks, As I before I edit this. But, yeah, that's that was the thing. Uh, just not. Nah, just he gets himself into trouble. It's just the fact that. Harley race, the old school mindset that doesn't fit in today, today's society. I mean, what we saw is what you see is what you get with CM Punk is the best way that I can say it about CM Punk is that's the, what you see is what you get. It's the fact of the matter is CM Punk is very much a bluntness, very brazen, and he'll tell you how he feels and what it is. I mean, not everybody hated him. You hear stories like Jamie Hayter is like, why would you not want to take advice from CM Punk? Because, I mean, he does have knowledge about the business. He's been around the greats. I mean, this is a guy in 2011 who out merch sales John Cena during the pipe bomb run, you know? And, I mean, with AEW now, it really shows it doesn't matter where you are on the card. I mean, he was the number one merch guy for AEW, and he was bringing the numbers there. But it's like, if you're going to be a dick after a special happened last year then you got to go now mind you the young bucks and all of them were not innocent in this either uh the jungle boy situation was he wanted to use glass on collision i believe it was and he wanted to use real glass and everybody was telling him no tony shivani told him no all these people told him no so they asked the guy who is easily triggered and easily <laughs> gets pissed off and cm punk hey can you tell him not to use the glass and he told him and then he did that with the whole you know real glass crimea river like he's justin timberlake on all in and it just oh. really it triggered him, and he put him in a choke. They shoved each other. It was just, it was a thing. So now, as of right now, CM Punk is fired. He's been terminated, if you will, 
from mm -hmm. AEW and Jungle Boy has been suspended and there's still people on the internet and I'll ask you guys this because we'll increase the profanity if you will because we are an uncensored show it is my show and we will say what the fuck we want <laughs> um, <laughs> Robert I'll well start. Nicola does anyway <laughs> so Robert there's no start. filter right so there's people that have been conflicted that they both should have been fired not Jack Perry just being suspended CM Punk rightfully got fired Tony did put his foot down even after we'll talk about Tony Khan in a second, but he finally put his foot down legals on it. Boom. He's gone. Jack Perry. Do you think he should have been fired as well? Or are you okay with the suspension? I'm okay with the suspension. Um, Jack with his just recent heel turn, um, you know, and I, and I'm not alone in this has been absolutely mediocre as all hell. I agree. It has not been the best for him. And I think, this would have been a great opportunity for him to get some heat. CM Punk being still being the face that he is, um, still liked by a lot of people. This would have created a great opportunity for Jack to get some heat, get that heel heat going against, uh, you know, the number one baby face in the company, if you will, I guess. Uh, this could have set something up, but... CM Punk decided otherwise. He uh, forgot everything, apparently, and uh, did what he did. And uh, like I said, it was unfortunate. But it is what it is, I guess. Nicola, do you think, as the conflicting reports have said, people online, we all talk, we all, you know, converse, if you will, we all interact. Do you think Jungle Boy should have been fired as well, or are you okay with the suspension? I'm okay with the suspension. I don't think he should have been suspended either. I think he did. I don't think he did anything wrong. I think CM Punk just does what he normally does, which is blow things out of proportion. Pay attention to me, that kind of stuff. So no, I don't think he should have been suspended. And I'm happy. I'm not happy he is, but at least, yeah, I'd rather he wasn't fired either. But actually, to be fair, when it all happened, I start where three of us were chanting, "Thank you, Jack." I love that. I love that. Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, yep. when he when he does come back, this might be like the equivalent of uh, when Roman Reigns beat the Undertaker at WrestleMania. Yeah. But not, yeah, yeah. Have have Jack come out to the ring and just hold a microphone for five minutes while he's getting the shit boot out of him. Yeah. Like this is this is now the man responsible for ending CM Punk's wrestling career. Possibly. Thank you, Jack. Here's what you do. He cuts the promo and then he just goes, well, I guess that fire finally burned out, taking off the uh, CM Punk, this fire burns theme song. WWE. There you go. It burns, burns, burns. A ring of fire. fire. <laughs> well, that's the thing, too. Like you mentioned, one of the most iconic moments after Roman beats The Undertaker in 2017 and then just booze and then this is my yard now. Oh, that was iconic. But the thing, too, is when it comes to Jungle Boy, I mean, you hear conflicting stories. Like, the story is apparently Punk just said up to him, do we have a problem? And Jungle Boy goes, well, you heard what I said. And then it turns into the choke. And then the other conflicting story is CM Punk is like, we got a problem. And Jungle Boy goes, no, nah, man, I was just looking to get some heat. So you really don't know unless you watch the video. But the main point in the general consensus is CM Punk, who a lot of people were not fans of. There were some that liked them, some that didn't. People talk about it, and the three of us talked about it. I mean, we're going to talk about it here. The collision where Tony came on, the pre-recorded message of firing him. He's terminated from his contract. Uh, WrestleNomics, Brandon Thurston, who's been on AEW's uh, media scrums and whatnot. He's known for bringing the analytics and <laughs> statistics from the quarter hours of ratings and just to see what we have from different shows. It was reported that after Tony made the announcement, 89,000 people tuned out of collision after he did the thing of CM Punk is fired. What were your guys' initial thoughts on this? And, Roberto, I'll start with you before I get to the crazy one over here. Well, you're both crazy, but you're equally crazy, and I love you. So, Roberto, I'll start with you. What were your thoughts on the droves, so to speak, turn, tuning out of collision after Tony announced that he's fired? I 100% I believe it. Um the thing about having these polarizing characters, um, or I don't even want the characters, I don't think they're characters at this point, uh, CM Punk, um, there's people who won't watch AEW because CM Punk's on the show. I know people personally who won't watch AEW because the Young Bucks are on the show. Like, these, there are people that literally hate these people 
for their mere existence. And that is just absolutely fucking wild to me. Um, at the same time, I, watching the internet just kind of catch on fire for the last, um, you know, week or week and a half or so. Um, people are saying they're not going to watch Collision. Oh, I'm protesting against Tony. Oh, Tony's a fucking mark. Oh, he, you know, does this, that, or the other. And, you know, I'm not watching Collision. I'm like, if you didn't watch Collision yesterday, you missed a fucking hell of a show. It was great. Probably one of the best Collisions I, I think we've had to date. If you feel so strongly that you need to boycott a show, be my guest. I I will just tell you that you're missing out. I'll add on to that point before we get to one NM over here. I'm talking about Nicola McDonald. Before we get to the NI to the C to the O to the L to the A, I got to put it to you like this, man. So Rob Roberto talks about people boycotting, tuning out. I remember when I was there for CM Punk's debut in WWE on the ECW brand against Justin K, Justin Incredible, excuse me. The main event of that show was Batista and the Big Show, and everybody chanted change the channel at them because they didn't want to see these two fight for the ECW championship. And it was epic, and it was at the Hammerstein Ballroom. So people do boycott and want to hijack shows to add on to Roberto's point here. I mean, there's a lot of polarizing, polarizing figures that want to tune out because they are so like, no, you took my CM Punk away from me what the heck are you doing so everybody talks about him going to wwe we'll just debunk this right here if he does there's a money match with him and roman reigns there's a money match with him and seth rollins i mean they talked about you know he was apparently in talks with them in december 22 after the brawl out happened and he wanted to be in the royal rumble and face kevin owens at wrestlemania i mean you don't know but i mean where he goes if i was any company i would not want to deal with him because he's a doggone headache and you don't no. want the headache this is why when he was coming to AEW after the backstage thing, at when he was on Fox doing his thing thing there, one person in the WWE hire company just said, well, you know, he's their headache now. And, well, he was right. He was <laughs> right. Yeah. So, it, it, I'm sorry, Robert. Go ahead, buddy. It, it's funny that you mentioned KO because KO has told several stories about Punk and ROH. Like, if I, if I had some guy, you know, coming up and telling me that I'm too fat and I need to lose weight, yes. I wouldn't want to work with you, you either, you you shithead. Well, yeah, he freaking much was fat. He's like, why are you wearing a T-shirt, man? Why are you wearing a T-shirt, man? That was it, right? He's like, why are you wearing a T-shirt? Yeah. Yeah. Like, Kevin Kevin Owens is a big fellow. We're, we're not going to yes, deny that. But Kevin Owens is probably one of the most agile big fellows I've ever seen in my life. Like, and to sit here and, you know, ridicule this man because he's overweight? Come on, dog. That ain't it. I'll take it back for everybody because, first of all, you're talking about the agility. I remember I first saw him against Pele Primo. There's a name for the old Ring of Honor fans there. Uh, he wrestled, yeah, right? He wrestled Pele Primo at uh, Lake Grove, Long Island. And that was the first time I ever saw the package pile driver. And I'm like, okay, I like that. <laughs> I like that. That's a badass move. Yep. So, Yep, yep. So, Nicola, yep, yep, your yep. thoughts on 89,000 people tuning out of collision, mind-blowing decisions, causes head-on collision. CM Punk, they said, we're out of here. Deuces. Deuces, ooses, to quote Jay Uso. What were your thoughts on the 89,000 people in droves turning out and everything that happened from collision? So, I'm not a CM Punk fan, but that does not mean that I would tune out just because he wasn't there. Right. Or if it's any wrestler, like you said and Robert said, it wouldn't matter if it was him or Jungi or Darby or st any of them, it would still be, you still watch the show, even though you hated him. So obviously I dislike him with a passion, but it didn't stop me watch. I think it's stupid. I think that you shouldn't base one person in the whole company to then base it, especially not that idiot. No way. And wherever he goes, like you said, he's been nothing but a headache and they warned us and, oh, look, it was proven. He's an utter tosser. Fair enough. Let him go off to wherever he's going, WWE, whatever, and then what? They can sack him too. That's how this is going to go. Again. Again. Yeah. But twice. Yeah, it'll be twice. But the thing, like you said, he's one of these people who he won't say it to our faces. He'll say it when he's in a distance. Or if he does, then he'll go running and say, oh, Nate, this. Fuck off, grow up, you're a fully grown man. Deal with it. He's 44 years old. He's literally like... Exactly, that's my point. He's literally... You're a fully grown man. Fuck off. 
That's my thing, too. And Triple H said it because we know CM Punk had his issues with Triple H during the time. Triple H legit said on the Stone Cold Steve Austin podcast, people would run up to me and say, hey, you know, Punk's not having a good day. He's he's doing this. He's bitching. He's going off. And then Triple H would go up to him and say, we got a problem. He goes, no, we're good. Then why are you bitching? <laughs> why are you bitching? <laughs> Be more open. If you have a problem, say something. Like exactly. You- Don't hide behind a freaking... Well, in his case, himself. Well, he thought he was hot shit Coward. because, like, with WWE creative. Hot shit. <laughs> right, where well, he dreaming? Talks, where everybody talks about the creative. He would. He even talked about it on his Best in the World TV. Like, he would rip up, like, what they have for creative. But it's like, dude, like, if you have a problem, again, he is not one of the guys that just likes to talk about his problems. He just, you know, well, he talked about on the Cole Cabana podcast. Like, he was supposed to be, and I believe in one of the 12 rounds is, I believe the second one that had Randy Orton in it, like he was going on the European tour and then, you know, he's like, well, you know, we might have to go on the European tour because that's when they were filming the movie. And then they just gave it to Randy Orton without telling him. And he's like, you could have told me that, you know, that you were going to put Randy Orton in the movie instead of like giving me the runaround. And he goes, well, that's what they do. And I'm like, well, maybe people don't want to talk to you because you're a shithead and they know how you are. So they don't want to talk to you, punk. Oh, I, I, I just recently seen this uh, this promo with Punk at Triple H where he's just like, CM Punk only wants to be the catalyst of change if he's on the top. And uh, listening to this thing, I'm just like, oh, fucking oh. Hunter was on to something here. So what he's referring to, folks, is when CM Punk came back and he was, you know, feuding for the championship. Who's the real champ between him and Cena? Triple H and him were feuding and Triple H goes, you know what, Punk? Some of these people actually like the WWE because that was the promo. And he's like, you're just in it for yourself. You don't care about the change. And everybody's like, who would have thought that 2011, almost 12 years ago from when that promo happened, that, God dang it, we used to cheer for this guy and root for him. And now it's just like, holy shit, he was right. <laughs> what it is it's it's I mean, H- H- hunter even said you know when when i you know had to step over people at least i looked him in the face and did it and he did he and did he, ab- he absolutely did mm-hmm. Hunt- hunter might be a dick too but at least he did it to your face so i should have left him in the coffin and just buried him in that match just left him in the coffin and just buried him <laughs> or done what they do with the dragging it behind the car and stings driving the car that would have been interesting <laughs> but yes, I think before we do close this out, because we went a lot on a lot of the drama and stuff here. But here's the thing, folks. We're actually gonna do. I'm gonna say this to you guys. We're gonna do. <coughs> we're gonna do more series on AEW and focus on different divisions because this has really been a great breath of fresh air. Really looking at the genesis of what happened with AEW. So we'll do more of these, and I can't wait to do them with you both. But I think the last topic I want to talk about. We talk about the great talents. We talk about professional wrestling as a whole. There's a variety for everything. Enjoy professional wrestling. Let's just enjoy what we enjoy, like what we like, and go on and move on and move upward. So the final topic that we have to talk about is that fucking Mark, the guy with the glasses. He's a Jacksonville Jaguar. He's the son of Shad Khan. We're talking about Tony Khan, who's like Richard Pryor and Brewster's Millions. He's jumping up and down like this. He's so excited. I own a wrestling company. He's on the message boards. He's one of those guys. People talk about Tony Khan. <laughs> and only talk to him as a booker. He needs to stick up for himself. Well, we just talked about the fact that he finally fired Punk. What are your initial thoughts of Tony Khan and his management style? Because there's been a lot of hoot nanny. Dare I say there's a lot of hoopla that goes on. So what are your initial thoughts on how Tony Khan handles his business? Because you got to admire him for starting the doggone company. And here we are now. But I got to say his managerial stuff is very questionable at times. And Robert Davis, I'll let you start here because you're a professional businessman, somewhat kind of maybe. What are your thoughts about Tony Khan? Yeah, somewhat kind of maybe. Um, yeah. Tony Tony's actually around the same age as me and Nicholas. So um, that that's just fucking mind-boggling to really think as it is um you know this man is a billionaire he owns four companies uh and helps run a football team uh american and uh european um he he does a lot like if you really look at it like holy shit this this guy has his hand in all the cookie jars um what a lot of people I don't think realize either. Um, they they just kind of assume this guy is uh, just a mark with a bunch of money, um, and, and that's not the case. He's uh, actually an educated man. He has a bachelor's degree in finance, so um, he, he's not going to blow all this money uh, like people seem to think he is going to do. Um, he, he does have a good head on his shoulders. Um, he does seem to know what he's doing somewhat. Um, 
four years into the business, I, I think he's doing a lot better than some. I, I know some of his biggest critics being a certain Jimothy Cornette. Um, you know, Smoky Mountain Wrestling lasted all of, what, two years? 95, 96 maybe, yeah, one or two years. Two, two, three years tops, and uh, t- Tony will be coming in a year four, going five. Um, you know, there's not a lot of room to talk anymore. Uh, Tony's definitely doing something right. And while some of those things may be questionable at times, uh, he he's definitely moving in the right direction. Um, you know, and I forget who I was talking to. I may have been talking to you guys, but for being a billionaire, um, I, I think Tony is one of the few that actually does have a good heart and a good head on his shoulders. Uh, what he recently did for uh, the fires in Hawaii with um, Fight for the Fallen and uh, Fighter Fest, um, allowing uh, some of his employees to go to uh, Bray Wyatt's funeral, and having nice. a, having a, having a jet sent for them to uh, get them to TV if they wanted to perform, which you know I'm sure most of them did. Um, he he's done a lot of uh, really good things for the community and. Um, you can't really say that a lot about the other billionaires in the world. Um, you know, I, I just hope uh, as Tony gets older, he uh, doesn't lose that about himself. Because I know it's easy to get lost in these mountains of money, if you will. Um, I, I, I just hope he uh, continues to do the right thing. Before we get to Nikola, I got something to tell you, Robert. You stupid motherfucker! What the fuck you mean? He's a good guy. He's nothing but a goddamn son of a bitch. So, Nikola, what are you? So, Nikola, what are your thoughts about Tony Khan and his management? You stupid motherfucker! What are your thoughts about Tony Khan? So, yeah, obviously, I am like Robert was saying. He has his hands in all kinds of cookie jars, and obviously, I'm aware of him from the wrestling, but obviously, from his UK football team that he has over here. He's well known, and I know about it because I'm a huge, uh, not his team personally, but I am big on football over here. So, yeah, there's that. But I think he has got his head screwed on. Yes, he does make some very questionable, questionable decisions. But as you said, he's not one of these well off people who has got his head up his ass. He's someone who's smart. He knows what he's doing, even though sometimes you think, why the hell did you think that? But I think he's done well for four years and I think he's going to carry on with it. And I think that, like you said, people with that amount of money can be very power hungry, not pointing any fingers in any directions, but you know where I'm going with that. Um, Yeah. Uh, Other than that, no, I think he's very, I like him. I've got a lot of respect for him and I think he's going to go far, but I do think he sometimes has to second, uh, has to question some of the things he does say. We uh we, pro- we we probably got to get him ten minutes of time to get a haircut. I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, if yeah maybe that as well. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. He's curly whopper. <laughs> so I have been critical myself of Tony Khan, not to the extent of Jim Cornette. Nobody will get to that point where you actually despise somebody. I think he generally do has a good heart. I love his passion and persistence for professional wrestling. I mean, this is a guy who's been there for 30 years. I understand. I think that's wonderful. My issue is like how stuff he can't, how he comes off for. I'll mention CM Punk the last time here when CM Punk is coming back to cut that, you know, the counterfeit bucks promo on collision. And he's in doggone gorilla chanting CM Punk, CM Punk, CM Punk. That, (laughs) that, that, that right there is a, yeah, uh, what he's dressing like, uh, like friggin' Orange Cassidy at Halloween is another one. Even though it's cool, it's funny, but it's yeah, funny. It, it is. But it's it just, you know how you look. And, all right, <laughs> the hugging. There's nothing wrong with a hug, but here's the problem. Hi. So I know, we've talked about this. I know you love to hug. I'm a hugger, too, but it, it, here's the issue. So you guys, have you, uh, guys, have you guys... Who it also, is. Right. <laughs> have you, <laughs> Have you guys watched both the media scrums and have you seen the press conferences that WWE after, does after their shows? Yes. Have you seen, okay. No. All right. Well, you haven't seen the WWE one or you haven't seen the AEW one? Nicola. Um, I'm not sure I've seen it. I might have done. I'm not sure 100%. I might have seen the AEW one, but I'm not sure about the other one. So I know he loves his brand, which again, we talk about. I love that. I think that's awesome. But 
he does not need to be sitting out there the whole doggone time doing two hours and friggin' just taking all these questions. There comes a time when you got to wrap it up, and then people are telling you you can only take more questions because they have Adam Hopkins, who's in their public relations now, who was in WWE for many years. So you got to think he's going to Tony. Like this, like the people want to go home, Tony. <laughs> he's he's, go, he's, he's sitting in the, the back of the room going, going, he's doing this. He's, he's doing this, guy. Tony, no, the, yes, yes, look, look, look at this. Like Tony, shut Tony. all that, or is this, or is this? Shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up. The janitors have to clean, Tony. The people want to go home, uh, but that I think is the issue because there's also part of it. It's just like you know, he's he's tiptoeing through the tulips. He's having fun. I know it's like sunshine and rainbows up in there, like Rocky Balboa. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows, but he's up there. He's having fun. I get it. That's cool. But the, it's more structured. Of the WWE one is. Superstars first, Triple H comes out at the end, boom, we go home. You don't have to worry about the janitors and Yeah. You don't have to worry about that. That is how I think he does it. But again, I know he loves it. He's even stated when they did the 200 thing and afterwards, and he's out there with Jericho talking about I love pro wrestling. But I think it's those little subtleties, intricacies, and nuances that people look at him and it's like, oh God. But at the end of the day, I think he does have a good heart. I think you know, people thought TNA wasn't going to last. I mean, it started in 2002, and then they thought it was going to be over by what, like year two, 2003, 2004? And they've been around for 21 hey dollars. Yeah. They, they literally have a pay per view called Hard to Kill. Like, yeah, exactly. Come and on. I, people that was like thought a massive middle finger. See ya. <laughs> yes. That's the thing. People thought TNA was going to go out of business, and it hasn't. I mean, AEW right now is still okay. kicking. They have, they have Dynamite, they got Rampage, they got Collision. So. I mean, I wish Tony nothing but the best, even though, you know, that's all I got to say. That, that's the new thing with Tony. That's the new thing with Tony. That's the new signal. We're going to do it here. Just I love that one. <laughs> we want to go home. <laughs> oh, you so... Stop. <laughs> This massive sign language when it comes to Tony Khan. Like, oh, no, yeah. oh my God. Anyway, so folks, I hope you enjoyed this edition of <laughs> Deep into the Heart of Wrestling. <laughs> we talked about many things from Tony Khan to AEW. We're going to do more in this series here, but I think that's the perfect way to end it. And before we close this out, one of the last things that we have to mention uh, Wrestle Dream. I believe it's called Wrestle Dream, right? That I guess. Wrestle Dream. Wrestle Dream October 1st, they've officially announced the Dream Match. People want to see it. Brian Danielson and Zack Sabre Jr. I'm hyped. I know you guys are hyped as well. My God. It, it almost doesn't matter what else is on the show because that's it. That's it yeah. right there. Selling point. Uh, yeah. So that weekend also features NXT No Mercy. So there's a lot of wrestling coming at you, folks. And whatever you do, enjoy wrestling, watch wrestling. We say it all the time. There is something for everybody. And just enjoy the amazing craft that is professional wrestling. And if you want to enjoy some more amazing craft, we got this musician over here, Robert Davis, who's all up and down at like 6 o'clock. Boom, all around, up, down, all around. Where can we follow you, sir, and promote the TSK reviews? Link tree forward slash hey it's Rob. Uh, all my social media is up there. Come check me out with the boys in the TSK and uh, the Max Wrestling YouTube kicking it with the TSK. We've got a review of All In. That was our latest show. We should have a review of All Out coming up pretty soon, uh, and a couple of other ones that are kind of in the pipeline. So. Uh, I'm not even sure which one's coming up, but uh, I guess if you subscribe, we'll uh, be surprised together. So, like, share, subscribe. All right, fair enough. How about you? How about you, Miss Nicola McDonald? Where can we follow you on Twitter and Instagram? Hell, hell, and hell. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> oh, am I? Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, let's see. This is not happening like it did last week. Nicola, I. I'm not, is it five three? There it is. Yay! On uh, on Twitter, and it's under the demon. I should have pointed that one out. Uh, if you want to follow me, Nick Mac, and that's as far as I know. Oh, and if you want to follow me, uh, the demoness herself on uh, Instagram, it's demoness there. Beautifully said. Links will be in the description um, below. 
And if you want to check out yours truly, subscribe to the Mike Larkin 92 YouTube channel, folks. We are almost at 600 subscribers, which you get to see this many shows and all that. Click the like button, subscribe. Give me old thumbs up, ski hell. Put it on your side like your orange Cassidy up in this bitch. I don't need a doggone catchphrase, goddammit. So if you want to check us out, SF Show 1, MCL 92 on the Twitter, Larkin underscore 92, M Larkin MB on the Instagram, Steve and Mike Show.com, LFC Fights.com, Capital Championship Wrestling. I'm all over the place, all things pro wrestling. I'm a podcast machine and i'm a chock full of talk and chock full of emotions right now i can't help myself but i will tell you right now i am not in fear of my life so for robert davis for equal effect titled my name is mike larkin this concludes another episode of deep in the side the heart of wrestling deep into it west side cross the pond east coast we do you with the most have a good night